Hey folks, uh, it's time to start the show, but Rish hasn't arrived yet. Uh, I thought I'd take this opportunity to apologize for, uh, well, two things really. First, I gotta apologize if anybody thought our last couple of shows were weak. Rish has really been dropping the ball lately, and that brings me to the important one. I gotta apologize for all the offensive things Rish has been saying in past episodes. He's just not a very cheerful person. And he loves to insult people to make himself feel better. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that two or three years from now, he won't even... Oh, okay. Here he comes. More later. Hey, Rish. Hey. Come on in. Time to start the show, right? Yeah. What kept you? I had difficulties maneuvering. And the vehicle I drove was not very efficient. Ah, uh, well, you ready to begin? Yes. Time to start the program. Rish? Yes? Is everything all right? Everything is within acceptable limits, yes. You seem a little off. Almost... Robotic? I was gonna say you seem kind of like a soulless, unfeeling prong, but sure, robotic fits. I'm sure that will pass. Welcome to the Dunsty Fiction Podcast. Today's story is... Rish? Yes, Big Anklevich? You are still Rish, right? What do you mean, my human friend? Well, th- well, that's just it. You don't sound like yourself. You sound like... A cybernetic organism that merely looks like your partner, Rish Outfield? Uh, yeah, a little. That is a ridiculous notion. Today's story is Time to Make the Donuts by Daniel... Rish, you called me my human friend. Is that not an accurate assessment of my relationship to you? Was that an Austrian accent, Rish? Nonsense. I am communicating in English. They do not speak English in Austria. Well, you certainly sound Austrian. Or at least a bad impression of an Austrian accent. Do not be silly. I have never been outside the United States of America. Rish. Yes, Big Anklevich. You're a Terminator, aren't you? Of course not. That would mean I was a machine, sent through time, programmed to fool you into believing I was Rich Outfield. But why? Why were you sent? My mission parameters are... I mean, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm Rish. Let's start the show. Today's episode is Don't Eat Yellow Snow, But the Brown is Fine by... Janice... You're not Rich Outfield. Big, come on, we're already two minutes in. We owe it to our many listeners to be professional and to the point. Okay, now I know you're not Rish. Why? Rish doesn't care about professionalism. Rish thinks this is all a big joke. Rish just wants to BS. I... I will address your points in a moment. Plus, Rish would never say that we have many listeners. He would say that we have one. Or none, now that we've gone on this long. I am Rish Outfield. I will prove it to you. Okay, how? Will you let me cut into your arm and see if there's bone or metal there? No, that would be unsanitary. But you may ask me three questions so I may prove myself. Okay, what do you think about Twilight by Stephanie Meyer? That book sucks. It will be totally forgotten by the year 2027. All right, whose October scary story was better, mine or yours? Yours was. Mine was way too long. While that's the correct answer, Rish would never say that. I am Rish Outfield. Fine. Last question. Who won Super Bowl XIII? The Pittsburgh Steelers over the Cowboys, 35 to 31. Wrong. January 1979. That is correct. It may be, but there's no way in hell Rish would know that. He doesn't follow football. He's into girly things like movie opening weekends and Michelle Branch songs and scrapbooking. I can explain. I have been studying up on football scores for a story. Research for a story. Oh, come on. A story I will never complete. Okay, that sounds a little bit more like Rish. It is all about football, so I know all the scores. Really? Then who won Super Bowl Forty Six? Super Bowl Forty Six, February 5th, 2012. The Panthers over the Buccaneers, 24-20. Big Anklevich, what are you doing with that gun? I'm pointing it at you. That is dangerous. Put the gun away, please. 
You screwed up, Terminator Rish. Super Bowl 46 hasn't happened yet. I can explain that again. You're a Terminator, admit it. I cannot. Lower the gun, Big Anklevich. Why? You're not afraid. It can't hurt a robot like you. I am not made of metal. I am a cheaper model. Ah, so you admit it. I mean, that was a joke. Ha ha ha. Do not shoot me, please. Okay, I'll give you one last chance to prove who you are. You see R-O-8-O-T in the corner? Yes, the helpful messenger robot. How do you feel about O-8-O-T? I feel... That is amusing, my mechanical friend, but I could not have become handsomer. So you think something he said was funny? Do you like O-8-O-T? Of course I like him. He is a unique and valuable addition to our podcast, and to humanity in general. I thought so. Man, that was weird. Okay, uh, sorry about that, folks. Welcome to the Dune Steve Big. Audio. Big? Big? Did I hear shooting? Rish? I. Holy crap. What did you do to the Terminator? I had to shoot him. He was here from the future to kill me. I, I didn't send him to kill you. I, I sent him to help out with the show. What? You sent him? Well, yeah, I, I knew I was going to be late to tonight's show, so I sent the Terminator back to take over for me, so we could get the podcast done on time. Really? Yeah. You shot him? Dude, he was expensive. Then why did he die when I shot him? Okay, he wasn't expensive. He was on clearance. On account of the face. So all that was just so we could do a better show? Yeah, I, I felt like we were slipping. and I thought he could help. Rish? Who won the Super Bowl last year? Last year? Was it the Celtics? Good to have you back, man. Up yours, R O T. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 71. I am your host, Rish Outfield. And I'm your other host, Big Anklevich. That's R-O-8-O-T. And I'm an Outer Man. All right, thanks everybody for showing up. Today's episode... Get the hell out of here. Yeah, hey, what he said. <laughs> I think I'm rubbing off on you a little bit. Should I have introduced myself as the angry Big Anklevich? Today's episode is Love Bites by Gregory Clifford. Gregory Clifford is a 43-year-old writer living in Farmington, Maine. Oh, yeah. He has no wife or kids, no cats or dogs, no real job to speak of. So he has plenty of free time to peck away at his keyboard and create stories. He was first published in 1997 when Beeline Books hired him to write two erotica novels. Since then, he has sold or donated a handful of short stories to various web magazines. Work and an addiction to online computer games have conspired to keep his creative output low for most of this decade. But he's finally come to a point in his life where he enjoys writing more than working or playing. So he is hoping to publish more stories in the coming years. A member of the Online Writing Workshop and the Science Fiction Writers Workshop, he primarily writes speculative fiction with a humorous bent. Love Bites by Gregory Clifford. Charlie? The tone warned him of the approach of a serious conversation. He set the menu down and looked across the table at Dementia. Not her real name, but the goth name she insisted everyone call her. To her, black was not just a color, but a way of life. Her eyes, her hair, and everything she wore were black. She even wore black lipstick and nail polish. The only thing white about her was her skin and Charlie could not look at that in bright sunlight without squinting. Yes? He asked. Have you ever thought of becoming a, a vampire? Charlie stared at her. 
Unlike Dementia, he had no problems blending into a crowd. Perhaps because he favored khaki shorts and polo shirts to her more funereal garb. At 25, he was a year older than Dementia, but he was so clean-cut and juvenile in appearance that people often mistook him for her kid brother. Uh, not really, he said to her. Do you think I look sexy as one? He envisioned her with inch-long fangs and shuddered. No. No? Seeing the hurt in her eyes, he quickly amended himself. I, I mean, no sense in messing with perfection, right? He smiled, but Dementia's expression remained dead serious. In fact, with the single candle on the table illuminating her pale face from below, she resembled a ghoul arisen from the grave. But a pretty ghoul. I think you'd look sexy as a vampire, she said. Me? Why? Well, your freckles would fade, and you'd have a killer smile. <sighs> Charlie shuddered again and picked up the menu, having a sudden hunger for anything with garlic. I'm sorry, but I don't think vampirism is for me. Dementia yanked the menu out of his hands and set it down. What do you have against vampires, Charlie? <sighs> he sighed. It looked like there was no escaping the subject. Nothing, I suppose. Except for the fact that they're dead. Undead. Dementia corrected. Right. Look, why this sudden interest in vampires? My friend Vladia just became one. She says it's great. Charlie thought of Dementia's best friend. A plump and pimply girl who was always throwing herself at boys. And missing. Great as in how? Well, she looks more beautiful. Rotting would have that effect on her, he murmured. She finds it a lot easier to bring home boys. That's because she can overpower them. Dementia frowned. Are you making fun of her? You know how I hate it when you do that. Charlie realized he had overstepped himself. I'm sorry. Why are we here? She said, looking around as if noticing her surroundings for the first time. The restaurant had an old world Tuscan motif lit by candles and electric oil lamps, and overgrown with plastic vines and flowers. Charlie and Dementia sat at a small table by a window overlooking the bay. It was just past eight and the dinner crowd was thinning out. You never take me to a fancy restaurant unless it's a special occasion. Well, I wanted to talk to you about something. You're not planning on pushing back the wedding, are you? No, I think a Halloween wedding will be fine. It's just... She took his hands. Just think of it, Charlie. As vampires, our wedding will be more special. We can exchange our vows in the cemetery under the stars, then be entombed side by side. It'll be so romantic. Picturing himself in a tomb made Charlie's pulse accelerate, but not with excitement. You know how I feel about enclosed spaces. Charlie, you're not seeing the whole picture. Many of your phobias will be cured once you become a vampire. You'll never die of sickness or disease. You and I will be immortal, and our love will last forever. Charlie tried to catch the eye of the waitress, but she was busy taking orders from a family of five at the opposite end of the trattoria. An elderly couple at a nearby table dug vigorously into their pasta and tried hard not to stare at dementia, whose voice must surely have carried... I'm sure there are many advantages to being a vampire, he said. But uh, I don't think you're thinking this thing through. Where are we going to get the blood we need to perpetuate our immortal lives? Blood banks. He blinked. You want to rob blood banks? Why not? It will be exciting. It will be suicidal. Nowadays, those places are guarded more closely than nuclear power plants. Fine, then, she said. We can find our own donors. You mean attack people? That's against the law, even in these liberal times. Only if they're unwilling, Charlie. I know plenty of goth girls who would die for the chance to be sucked by a vampire. Charlie's gaze shot to her neck. Well, I hope you're not one of them. No, Charlie, I want to suck, not to be sucked. The waitress overheard that remark as she walked up to the table. She stared at them with her mouth open. I'll, uh, give you more time, she said and hurried off to the kitchen. Charlie could feel his face burning. Dementia turned his right hand over and stroked his palm. Charlie, 
didn't you tell me you hated your dead-end job? She spoke in that seductive whisper she often used to get her way. It made Charlie tingle all over. Dementia was not the most beautiful girl he had known, but she was the most arousing. Yes? He said. Her hand glided up his forearm, eliciting even more tingles. Didn't you tell me you were tired of being treated like a nobody? Yes, but... Her fingers circled over the meaty muscle that connected his lower arm to his upper arm, and all the tiny hairs across his body quivered. Didn't you tell me you wanted to change your life? Charlie closed his eyes and willed himself to be strong. Yes, darling. I did. I do. But becoming a vampire is not what I had in mind. Her hand stopped moving. Oh, and what kind of change did you have in mind? Ordering wine with your meal instead of beer? No. Burning your Enya albums? No. Extending video nights to Saturdays? Not a bad idea, but no, I... I... She crossed her arms. You're so boring, Charlie. I swear, I don't know why I stay with you. We're just so different. Charlie carefully selected his next words not wanting to inflame her further. I thought you liked me because I was different. Dementia stared out the window and refused to meet his eyes. Uh, On our first date, he continued, you said you were looking for a stable guy to raise a family with. You said you were tired of goth boyfriends who took your money and cheated on you. Do you remember that? She did not answer, but he knew she was listening. Dementia, this is not some minor change you're asking me to make. You're asking me to turn my entire life upside down. I hate my job, sure. But where am I going to find a night job that pays even half as much? She shrugged. Not only will I take a big cut in pay, but I'll have to stop working on my tan and and stop going to church. He said. And how will I be able to look my mother in the face and, and, and tell her I can't eat her lasagna anymore because I'm a vampire? Stubbornly, dementia kept her gaze affixed to the rising moon. Charlie wasn't sure if he was getting through to her or not, but he plowed on. Do you think that just because vampirism is right for your friend, it's right for you? For me? For us? What about that family you wanted? You won't be able to bear children once you're undead. She looked at him, and he knew he had struck his mark. We could adopt, she said. Do you honestly think the state will allow a vampire couple to adopt children? And and suppose they did. How do you think the other kids will react to our children having two bloodsuckers as parents? You thought you had it bad in school, but what about them? She looked down at her lap. Dementia, we're entirely different people, and being together has not always been easy. But have I ever asked you to turn down your music? No. Have I ever asked you to stop getting pierced? No. Have I ever asked you to put on more normal clothes so that people would stop staring at us? No, Charlie, you haven't. I might hate your music and your clothes and your body art, but I love you. I love you despite your packaging. I thought you felt the same way about me. Dementia sat in silence for a few moments, then sighed. You're right, Charlie. I've been pretty selfish putting my needs ahead of yours. I never stopped talking long enough to listen. Now that I think about it, becoming a vampire does seem crazy. What was I thinking? I guess I'm so intent on fitting in with my friends that I forgot about the person who matters the most. I'm sorry. Charlie smiled. No need to apologize, Pumpkin. It's good to share our thoughts and feelings. Wasn't there something you wanted to talk about? Charlie hesitated. Yes. What? He held her right hand in both of his and took a deep breath. Dementia, have you ever thought about becoming a werewolf? Author's Note The idea for this story germinated in my brain while I was staring at a blank Microsoft Word screen and thinking about what I should write next. There is a strong goth subculture in my hometown. While walking down Main Street, I often pass young goths dressed in their black finery. I wondered... What if a goth girl with a vampire fetish and a seemingly normal boy fell in love? 
I thought it'd be funny to explore their relationship dynamic while they matter-of-factly debated vampirism as if it was simply another lifestyle choice. I had a fun time writing the story. The first draft took only a few hours to complete, with snack breaks included, and once I started, I couldn't wait to get to the twist at the end. I enjoyed turning Charlie into a complete hypocrite, and I hope you enjoyed it too. What, 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 what was that? What did he uh, say? He just said, welcome back, and I hope you enjoyed the story. I know I did. I'm recruiting some help. No, it's it's fine. We didn't let him participate in the last episode, and, you know, it was one of my favorites. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, that was a, a fun story, huh? You know, I was just commenting to you the other day that uh, we have never had a vampire story on the Dune Steve. I think we still haven't. I guess that's one way to look at it. Yeah, I've heard people say that zombie stories and vampire stories are done to death, but... Uh, well, they are undead, actually. <laughs> yes, boys and ghouls! Even though they may be done to death in films right now, we've not done a zombie story either, have we? No. I have absolutely nothing against those two. We have a, a zombies versus vampire story. In fact, somebody get to work on that right now. That's your broken mirror story for today. <laughs> Zombies versus vampires. And I want it to be better than monsters versus aliens, which was described by one reviewer as wildly unimaginative. You know, that's true. I remember they had that on the TV spot. <laughs> I guess that's not fair. I never did see that show. Can't really judge it. Well, hey, let's rush out and see monsters versus aliens. I mean, unless Pixar has a new movie out or something like that. Well, there is that one... Maybe we should see that first instead. This was another really short one, which is sadly what she said every time. It uh, wasn't a second time. You know me so well. <sighs> uh, this was a fun one, huh? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> All these things I've never heard a woman say. Yeah, he, he, does, he says that he writes speculative fiction with a humorous bent. But uh, this was one of those that I read because it was short and I knew that I could get another one done put a check mark there and uh, you would have to read the 6,000 word story that followed but uh, thank you very much I just I liked it it was like I said or will say I really just love the radio show stuff the the idea of a couple of people talking and they're different voices and uh, they just have a conversation and we have we talked about monsters before like what is your favorite monster what is your I don't think so maybe see because I, I used to do a horror website and I would say time and time again that uh, Werewolf was my favorite cinematic monster. And uh, really? we've, have, we've not done a werewolf story either, right? No, I don't think so. So this one almost covers those bases, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it almost gets two birds with one stone, but it misses them both, actually. I, I don't think werewolves would be my favorite, just because I guess I just don't watch enough horror movies. But you hardly ever see a werewolf in movies. Well, they're a lot harder to do than zombies. Yeah, or and vampires. vampires. You just give somebody some teeth and you're done. Right. Maybe a little makeup. There have been lots of vampire movies where they don't put the fangs in either. They're just handsome dudes or pale dudes. And uh -huh. Werewolves are a little harder. I mean, unless Robin Williams is the star of your movie, you're going to have to have a lot of makeup. <laughs> Wasn't The Fisher King a werewolf movie? I don't know. I think, I, I think he played Chewbacca in that oh, one. Was that what it was? I think you were forced to watch Robin Williams' bum jiggle in that movie, if I remember right. See, I paid to see that. Dang. <laughs> we had very different upbringings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but this isn't the week to talk about monsters. I just figured if, if we ever do we'll do a horror, if we ever do do a... If we ever do a vampire story, then we could talk some kind of vampire thing afterwards. If we ever did a werewolf story, we could talk about werewolves. If we ever did a zombie, if we ever did... But this week we didn't quite do one of those stories, so... No, it's not scary at all. You just classify this as a comedy, right? Yeah. I don't know, you probably... You probably, jeez, who am I talking to here? You dated a lot more than I did. <laughs> do you ever have something like this? Do you ever you ask out a girl, maybe you find her attractive, or the moment strikes and you ask her out, and then once you're on the date, you're like, oh no, this, is, this was a mistake. Um... And now it's time for Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. Because, you know, I hardly ever dated, and I was on one of those, what I used to call it the date from hell. 
Yeah. Where I went out with this girl and uh, yeah, for some reason I had taken a liking to her. We both worked at the same place and I had built up the courage to ask her out and we went out and it just, yeah, I was getting all these nasty vibes from her of, that she would rather be anywhere but there. <laughs> and we were, did have one of those actually. Well, maybe yours ends up a lot better than mine. We were going to do the whole dinner and the movie thing, but we were going to switch it up. So we went to the movie first, and then we were going to go to dinner. Cool, right? Yeah, nice. Um, we went and saw While You Were Sleeping. Ooh, I love that movie. You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Rich, look, an alien. Well, thanks, announcer man. Nice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I was purposely acknowledging him week to week, but that will never happen again, sir. Yeah, I'll get it there. Um, so, yeah, I took it to see While You Were Sleeping. And I was just really enjoying the movie. And I had it on good authority that every girl around that time enjoyed the movie, too. That's why we I went did. to it is because uh, my friend of mine said, oh, you, you better take her to that because, you know, girls just love that movie. And, and she'll be putty in your hands. Uh, and uh, I just got this icy vibe. Like I, I was dating what was the Frozone <laughs> from <laughs> The Incredibles through the whole movie. And I would laugh and I'd look over and she was cutting her wrists so i mean it was just some kind of clue that she was not having a good time you tell me where my super suit is woman you know that i have this terrible habit and to me it's like oh i pride myself with this habit but i can imagine how unfun this is to a girl but i like to stay through the credits I'll listen to the music watch the names but oh gosh she was so upset about the whole credits sitting thing that, you know, and, and then she had gotten up and she went and stood by the exit and she's like, she's stamping her foot. And I didn't know that women did that since this women's lib thing. So finally, you, I just, you didn't get the clue that you just needed to give up on the credits from that. Huh? So finally, I just stood up and I went and there was no salvaging this night. It, I'm trying to remember what it was. I, the things that I laughed at, she was like that lady in Jaws. Oh, I didn't think that was funny at all. And I just realized, wow, this girl either doesn't have a sense of humor or or I have somehow sucked the humor out of the situation. She's just so unhappy that she wasn't able to enjoy while you were sleeping. And so we're walking through the lobby. Really was one of those things like when your mom and dad are fighting and you're just like, oh, I don't even want to be in this room. Oh, geez. So we get out to the parking lot. And I was thinking... Do I want to ask her where she wants to go? Do I want to ask her if, she, if she's still hungry? And finally I said, you know, and she interrupts me and says, can you just take me home? And I said, that would be great. And I got in the car and I started it up and we, I drove her home and, and she was off like a shot, man. It was like the Kentucky Derby. She was just heading for the gate. And down the stretch they come. <laughs> in retrospect, me saying, oh, that would be great to get rid of you was maybe not the best thing. But it was just such an awful date. And uh, I guess that doesn't fit with this story at all because <laughs> those two are like in love yeah. and things go well and all that. They but didn't get in a fight though, like your mom and dad that you didn't want to be in the room with. Yeah. I'm wondering if I should cut out that whole thing. You could if you want. It's up to you, man. Was it not a good story? Uh, do you have a good story? Do you I have don't. Some? My story. I, I did have one date that was fairly lame, but <clears throat> all right. But hey, Gregory, I. It sounds like you write the kind of stuff that's just right up our alley. So hopefully you can send us another story and uh, we'll ruin that one too. <laughs> and now a word from our sponsor. Feel free to go to our website where we have a donation button. You can donate to our podcast. And if you donate, you receive a special gift from the Dune Steve. Uh, fart reel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, fart farts reel. from the last 12 episodes edited together <laughs> in one long toot. It's beautiful. Uh, you get a story written by Rish Outfield, which may seem surprisingly similar to a fart reel, but it turns out it isn't. And yeah, you can you can take a listen to that and see exactly why he has been turned down by the Drabblecast so many times. <laughs> Is that for <laughs> inclusion? Back on topic, guys. So you mentioned the Drabblecast. Um, Norm Sherman, our friend. Can we call him our friend? Sure. Your friend, Norm Sherman, has a distinctive way of reading his stories. And, I, you know, I'll go as far as to say that nearly every story is made better when Norm Sherman reads it. Yeah, it definitely happened with that uh, Christmas story of yours. I mean, it was a good story to begin with. But when I heard Norm Sherman, after, when he sent us his reading of that story, I went, wow, this sounds great. Something I never said to you 
before or, or after, but we're on the air, so I'll say it now, is had you asked me if we could submit that story for him to read, I wouldn't have let you. <laughs> I didn't feel like it was that good or whatever, or I would have wanted to polish it, and six months later, I still would have been <laughs> polishing it. We'll be releasing it um, for our Christmas in July episode. Yeah, so if you hadn't just sent it to him, yeah, there's no way that would have seen the light of day. So. Well, that's good, because that's what has happened to most of the rest of your stuff. So it's nice for something to see the light of day and not turn into a, what do they call those creatures on the time machine? Morlocks. Morlocks. Yeah. With large eyes, etc. Yes, we want more of my stories to be Eloy. And <laughs> at the same time, on another podcast, and I'm not going to say what it was, because I'm sure there are people that think that we suck. But there was another story. Rightly sto so. There was a story I just listened to the other day, and it was... A good story, I think, but the reading was so mediocre that it was hard to tell that it was a good story. There, uh, there were two female characters and at least two male characters, and the reader did the same voice for all four. And I didn't know unless they said, blah, you know, blah, Jen said. said that it was supposed to be a woman, and the two women, you know, Jen and Marjean or whatever they were. Or whatever. Ethel and Marjean, sorry, <laughs> I had to modernize it a little bit, were interchangeable and it just made it really hard to follow. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the reading of a story goes a long way. And so I, I just thought it might be kind of interesting, you and I having podcast almost for a year now, to talk about this. You and I had a really, really long commute when I moved away <laughs> from California. Right. And to pass the time, you would always listen to audiobooks. This was before the days of podcasts. Well, and before I discovered podcasts, anyways. I think they were going long before then, but... E, the truth should not get in the way of the point oh, I'm trying oh, to make. Oh, oh, sorry. We talked about audiobooks one time and how the, the reader could really make or break the story. <laughs> okay, one in particular was so good that you said that you had gone out and got books that you had no interest in. Great Expectations by Edmund Wells, the famous Dutch author, just because the reader was somebody that you liked. Yeah, that's right. I, I was listening to various Stephen King novels, and uh, I decided to give the Dark Tower series a chance. I, I'd read, when I was much younger, The Gunslinger, and gosh, it just seemed slow and boring and a little confusing, so I wasn't a big fan, and I didn't continue on to the rest of them. And I decided to give it another chance because I had a long commute. And so I listened to every audiobook I could get my hands on. So I saw The Gunslinger. And so I gave it a chance. I listened to it when it was read by Stephen King. Now, Stephen King is one of those readers that doesn't necessarily add a lot to the reading. He's got a really bad nasal quality to his voice. Give me an example. Um, the good example is the book that he read himself and published only as an audiobook. You can only get it in such a fashion at first, which was called Blood and Smoke. Goodness gracious, he would read that. And I was just like, Gah! every time he'd get to one of those words, it would really highlight his nasal abilities. But I made it through that book and I moved on to the next book in the series, which is The Drawing of the Three, which was read by Frank Muller. If you haven't heard of Frank Muller, you should run right out and check out every audiobook that the library has of his. Which is exactly what you did. It is exactly what I did. Holy crap, I absolutely loved his reading. And I went out and I started getting books. And, you know, great expectations, to tell you the truth. The Dickens or the Edmund Wells? <laughs> the Dickens, it turns out, was the one that uh, Frank Muller read. I had to read that as a freshman in high school, which I think is one of the faults of the American education system. Throwing a uh, Charles Dickens novel at a freshman in high school is just the wrong way to get someone interested in literature. It's an absolutely amazingly good book, but freshmen in high school are not ready for a book like that. There may be a few that are ready for something like that, but for the most part, Lord of the Flies, perfect for kids in high school. Great expectations? No. That's my instruction for you, Board of Education. Moving on. I absolutely despised that book when I was in high school. I couldn't read it. I couldn't stand it. We made fun of the goofy language that was in it. We, for years afterwards, went around and said, thank you, Pip, to people. And in, I remember in college, you mocked me and, and I didn't get the reference. 
and it was Pippin, which was my <laughs> given name being Pirip and my family name being Philip or some silly thing. And I was like, what? Right? Yeah. That's from Great Expectations. Yeah, that's right. Pip was the main character of uh, Great Expectations, and I could not stand it. And then I decided to get some classic literature read by Frank Muller. And I listened to Frank Muller's reading of Great Expectations absolutely amazing and it completely 100 percent changed my perception of the book from the time that i was a teenager and i had to deal with it read in my own head to frank muller reading it it's become one of my favorite books so good his voice is so rich deep and then he's got that great raspy old sounding voice that he does fairly often my favorite reader of all time and the worst thing is that frank muller is a motorcycle enthusiast or was a motorcycle enthusiast i should say and uh got himself in a pretty hairy accident and inflicted upon himself some serious brain damage and uh has for years now been unable to do the job that he used to do which was narrating books you know doing audiobooks and uh, i think stephen king and john grisham didn't they do like a, a special oh a fundraiser kind of yeah thing. a fundraiser for frank muller where they read some of their tales live in front of an audience and, and donated that to his cause it's a real shame that there won't be any more because his work is so amazing I've talked for a long time. Are there audiobook readers that you uh, enjoy a great deal? That was something that you and I had in common because I had already listened to a lot of Frank Muller. I had listened to Fahrenheit 451 done by him. And of course, yeah, he had done some Stephen King. He had done The Green Mile, which I have, and other things that aren't coming to mind right now. But the, the other one that really brought the book to life w would be Jim Dale, who does the Harry Potter books. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I actually listened to the first Harry Potter book before I ever read it. That was pre-movie. So my introduction to these characters was through his voice. I've always, ever since I was a little, little kid, I think when I was in first grade that Christmas, my parents got me a tape recorder. And I would just make up stories on the spot into the tape recorder. Then, you know, once the tape ran out, I would be done. <laughs> or... I would record over it kind of thing with the next story. And I just enjoyed storytelling in that way. And when I got a little bit older, I would write radio play kind of things, which was an easy way to write because it's just dialogue and you don't have to come up with all sorts of florid prose. You're just trying to get the point across. And, and you know, I've mentioned before that my dad was born in the wrong era. He would have thrived during the Wild West or during the Dust Bowl time period because he, I don't know, he's just got this old-fashioned sensibility. And even though I'm completely addicted to internet porn and going to the movies and, and <laughs> hover cars, I would have loved to have been around during the golden age of radio uh -huh. and been one of those Orson Welles-type people that wrote for the radio and, and had a group. We all read stories. And mm -hmm. it just, it, it thrills me. It's fun. I like to see it come alive. And anyhow, it was something that impacted me from a young age. And my dad had some old radio plays cool. that he had on cassette and we would listen to them. We would listen to, you know, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. We would listen to Abbott and Costello and, and, and things like that. And it, they, they used to call that theater of the mind because it was all in your head where you're mm -hmm. imagining what people look like and what's going on. And that's really a lost art. I remember at the end of the 90s, they tried to sort of bring that back and have a bunch of celebrities that would get together and record. And, and you know, like the Star Wars radio drama and stuff uh -huh. like that. They, they, they have find tried. Those sometimes. Yeah, my point is that it's almost completely gone. But here we are in the 21st century. And it seems to be pretty resurrected to me. Right. We've got this podcast thing. And everywhere I look, there are people that are doing audio dramas that are original and it's a bunch of friends that have gotten together and recorded them or they're just commenting on sports or on movies or on backwoods abortion clinics and just whatever people's pastimes happen to be. They're their they're loves. So it's great that we came along when we did and we were able yeah. to do this. And it certainly kept us close. We see each other every single week, rain or shine or snow. Uh, and, and here we are again. <laughs> And the whole audiobook industry, I mean, 15 or 20 years ago, they didn't release audiobooks. Now every book comes out with an audio edition as well as book. Every major release has yeah. an audiobook version. It's, and it's because of people like you, the fat, 
<laughs> oh, no, no, I'm sorry. People like you, the, the, the ones that have commute, that don't have time to sit and read like they would like to, but still want to find out what's going on in the newest James Patterson novel. Well, speaking of bad readers, I was not a fan of the readers that read James Patterson novels. And I'm not sure how much it was that I just grew tired of James Patterson's shtick, the way he tended to always do things, or if I just couldn't stand the people that read his books. That turned me off from him, but I don't read James Patterson anymore. He was in the first episode of Castle, right? That's right. Good show. Have we ever recommended that on the podcast? No. We should. Go watch, watch Castle. Castle. Stereo. So I just got sick and tired of the way the guy read was just terrible. I also used to listen to Patricia Cornwell, and the person who read for her tended to get on my nerves, too. So I gave up her stuff as well. Those were both authors that my wife kind of introduced me to. So it was easy to give them up because, you know, they weren't ones that I held dear from my childhood or whatever. Yeah, I've never been able to listen to the audio performance of a Robert Jordan novel because they use those exact same two readers. Do you think that it is the voice of the reader or the way that they read? Because the one that I used as our example to start the show, where he didn't vary uh -huh. his reading technique and all the voices were the same and the narration was the same as the dialogue, it wasn't his voice. It was the way he read the story. Right. And in your case... It was mostly the way that they read the story. Okay, because there are certain... I mean, let's, let's change it over to singers. Natalie Maines, the lead singer of the Dixie Chicks, Oh, okay. she sings at this pitch. Just wherever the timber of her voice is, it bothers me. Huh. And I know that you've complained about Tina Turner that same way. Oh. Right? <laughs> yeah. And for me, there are a couple of them, like Alison Krauss, that just happens to be the tone of the voice or the pitch or whatever. I can't listen to it. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not good singers or that the songs aren't good. I think a couple of those Dixie Chicks songs would be great if the brunette sang them. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's some way my brain is wired. And when I hear that, it's just, uh -huh. uh, I think of the dentist's drill and how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> is there a reader, an audiobook performer that you've run into this that same way? Because I personally have never had that problem it's always the way that they perform the book for so example it's not king's voice well i guess with stephen king it actually is his voice that bugs me he actually does a pretty good job in the performance because of that i can get through it i listen to needful things which is a really big long book performed from start to finish by stephen king his voice bugs me but he does a good enough job with the performance that i can see past it but the other way around, you know, the, the people whose performance bug me, it doesn't matter that there's a normal voice. It can even be a nice sounding voice to tell you the truth. But the way they perform it just drives me crazy. And they tend to do the exact same kind of a performance from book to book to book. And so you're just like, oh, I hated that in the last book. And now here you are doing it again. There was a book one time that you owned on audio. You bought this book and then through the book. Did you even finish it? No, I didn't. And why was I, it? it I was... literally threw it. <laughs> it was the performance, wasn't it? It was. It was TikTok by Dean Kuntz. My friend Jeff had recommended that. And he says, oh, it's great. And he had read the book. <laughs> uh -huh. And I saw the audio book like the same week that he happened to mention that. And it was like, oh, kismet. And I grabbed it and I bought it. And B.D. Wong read the book. And I don't know what it was, but just his voice. I made me wish that I were dead. <laughs> I listened to that same audio book. I happened to check it out from the library, so at least I didn't pay money for it. But uh, I have to agree with you. I managed to make it through it, but at that time, you know, I, I would listen to anything I could get my hands on. But yeah, I think the biggest problem was how poorly he did the lead female character. She well, it sounded like a stereotype. It sounded like Andrew Dice Clay making fun of a woman. <laughs> Somebody that had no respect for a woman saying, this is the woman's voice. Oh, when are you going to do that? Oh. And I thought, oh my gosh, no. But it was worse than that. It was like the main character goes and he meets a absolutely flaming queen on his uh, adventure instead of a woman. You know, he played it like uh, what's his face on Will and Grace. Um, I'm sure I don't. Yeah, know. you watch that show religiously. It was like Nathan Lane as the lead female character in this novel. So it 
totally gave you the wrong feel for what it was going for. I think somehow B.D. Wong thought that he was making her sound like a free-spirited, fun girl, which is what she was supposed to be, but it wasn't what he was making her sound like. I see. I ejected the cassette, <laughs> threw it, then crossed the room and stomped the hell out of it. <laughs> and in retrospect, that was dumb because I could have just sold it. I've right. gone to the used bookstore and said, here, I listened to this all the way through. Share it with another fine patron who is enjoying the audio book. But I didn't. And the sad thing is, yeah, you never made it to the end of the story. It was actually, like Jeff said, it was a good book. It was really fun. It was funny, which I don't know that that's Dean Koontz's specialty, but he managed to pull it out in this book. It was really humorous and off the wall. And uh, You said he managed to pull it out in this book. <laughs> I swear. Did I say pull it out? Once I was managed to get past the absolutely horrible reading, it was a pretty good book. So I guess it goes both ways. Someone like Frank Muller can take a book like Great Expectations, which I hated, and turn it into one of my favorite books. And then someone like B.D. Wong can take a book, which is good and was recommended to you by someone who read it and enjoyed it, and turn it into a terrible experience for you. So the reader of the story, as far as audio goes, is very important. I, I guess this is our pat ourselves on the back moment <laughs> of the episode. And you know me, I can't say anything without attacking myself. I'm the most self-deprecating. -defer yes, that <laughs> smell. I'm the most self-deprecating person you'll ever meet. But I really enjoy reading these stories and performing and coming up with voices and putting the whole thing together. And I hope that the Steve team is more like Frank Muller. And people hear what we do with their stories and say, dang, that's really solid. The other day, somebody mentioned that they hadn't imagined a character with a certain accent that we gave them, but it really came alive when they heard it with that accent. And now that's how they think of the story. And to me, that was a great compliment. But at the same time, I've heard myself on readings and thought, gosh, if he would just take the apple out of his mouth, that would sound so much better or I'll be like, oh, do I really sound like that? The same way that anybody does when they hear a recording yeah. of themselves. And, and there's probably people out there who have sampled our work and thought, you know, I can't stand the way that outfield guy reads or I can't stand to hear his voice for a 45 minutes after the story talking about Star Wars and He-Man. <laughs> and so there's that. I'm, I'm willing to accept that my voice isn't for everybody, that I may be the Natalie Maines for you. <laughs> Hopefully we make something that you enjoy. If our conversation here has inspired you in any way to perhaps share some of your favorite readers out there. You know, I wish somebody had told me about Frank Muller before I discovered him. I would have loved to have known just how great he was and, and listened to that many more of his stories when I still had access to a large library instead of the podunk small town library that I have now. But uh, feel free to leave a comment on the blog about this. Tell us about who your favorite reader is out there is, be it a podcaster or a professional reader. Another one that I think is really good is George Guidel. He's got a really good voice. Frank Muller had been in his accident before Stephen King finally got around to finishing off the uh, Dark Tower series. And so I heard the last few books read by George Guidel. It was just amazing. Some of the voices that he would pull out, and he had this utterly distinctive voice for the gunslinger, Roland, that it didn't have to say, Roland said, or any of that kind of crap for you to know who was speaking when he would talk, and it was really well done. Another one, a podcaster, I just love listening to, whether he's reading or whether he's commenting about his own life. Uh, our friend Alistair Stewart over at oh, yeah, Pseudopod. Can, can we call him our... Uh, your friend, <laughs> Alistair Stewart, it sounds like a storyteller that you just love to visit and listen to his life. Yeah, he's very good. Uh, oh, and another example from our own podcast, Liz Mississippi. Mirzieski. She can sound like a child. She can sound like a sexy school mom. <laughs> and she can sound like herself. Um, I, I just feel like when we send her something that it's going to be great. Yeah. And she hasn't let us down. To me, that's a pleasure. It's great to have her on our team. Last week, I talked about Abby Hilton. This week, Liz. Yes. Thank you. Another one of my favorites, Mer Lafferty. 
She's just got a f- fantastic voice. It's just fun to listen to her voice. It's like listening to uh, Billie Holiday sing or something. I don't know. It's just got that great quality to it. And I really enjoyed her book oh, that she keeps. podcasted. Yeah, Playing for Keeps. So, yeah, if you've got a, a favorite that you'd like to mention before we go ahead and mention them all ourselves, uh, we'll leave that open to you. To well, uh, Before 2006, I wasn't aware that podcasts existed. Me neither. So there are tons out there that I've never heard, podcasts that no longer exist, mm-hmm. that unless somebody mentioned, hey, you should check out that, I would never ever hear. And there's podcasters and people that are probably great that I would look forward to listening to every single week if I knew about them. So share that stuff. And again, back padding, winding down. If you guys like us, tell somebody the same way that you like what we do or you like the voices or you like our banter or you like uh, that stupid robot's nasty (laughs) comments about me daily. And maybe other people will discover us and dig us. And I would like to be able to continue doing this. This is fun. Before we podcast, we would read each other's stories anyway Mm -hmm. because it's just something that I enjoy doing. And so if come 2010, we can still be doing this, I'll be happy. Well, Uh, the closest approximation I can get to it. Um, uh, If you want to make sure that that happens, you could also stop by our website and donate. And if you'd also, you know, like to help us out in another way, you could leave a review for us on iTunes. We'd love to uh, get a little more recognition over there. The more reviews we get, the more likely it is that the folks at iTunes might say, hey, these guys must have something special. Let's feature them. And then we could get a lot of listeners that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So we would like that. You and I, we were in film school together, and we collaborated a couple of times on student films, whether uh, I was writing it and you were directing it or we were both writing together. And something that we did our senior year that I wish we had done the year before, but I didn't really know you, was that we would hold auditions. We would write up scripts and we would have people come in and act them out and we would just watch. And then once they left the room, we would talk about how hot they were. I mean, we would talk about how well they performed. And there were a couple of people, you know, they were theater majors or something like that, or they had a passion for it. They would be so good that I'd look at you and say, I never thought that line was funny. I wrote it, but I never thought it was funny. And he made it funny. He, he took the material and he elevated it. I hope that we can at least do justice to the material that people are giving us, that are sending us week to week, uh, if not elevating it. If you think that we elevate material then by all means, send us a story. That's right. Submit us something so that we can uh, reject it. (laughs) See what he did there? He (laughs) he set you up and he kicked you right in the legs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, submit us something so we can take a look at it and and, and see if it's right for our show. We'd love to uh, see what you got. We're trying to do more episodes more frequently. Of course, the fact that every one of our episodes is long is making it harder to do that because we only have so much bandwidth per month. But... Well, it's only 12.11. Three minutes from now, we'll be done. And we can, if we want, we can read another story. I, I, it doesn't seem too late to me. I want to watch Castle, though. You watch it with your wife. You no, betrayed and murdered me. I do, you helped I, the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. They were guardians already. of peace and, and, and justice throughout the galaxy. And you shot on them. Which is the past tense of Shitner. <laughs> <laughs> so... In the short amount of time since we recorded all of our conversation, I did a little bit of research, and and I've got some bad news for you. Um, Frank Muller actually passed away in June of 2008. Really? Yeah. From complications of the accident. It was sad, and I I figured we had to acknowledge it on the show since, you know, he was basically the... The reason we did the conversation in the first place? Right. And... I know that there are new audiobook fans every single day, new people who discover podcasts or discover whatever it might be. And uh, I'm sure if he were around, he would love for people to continue to discover works of literature because of his voice, the way that you described about Great Expectations. And, uh, you know, that's that's a way that he can live on. Yeah, that's one of those things about the various media that are recorded is that, yeah, I mean, they live on even after the people who have uh, who created them have, have long passed and, you know, they're uh, still inspiring people today, years after their death. You know, Frank Muller will continue to inspire me even though he's gone. I figured to honor the man, I mean, we could do another little episode or an addendum, but but why not just 
yeah. delay that episode a couple of days, yeah, stick this in there, and uh, and mention his passing. You know, it's it, it's something that we talk about all the time, you and I. And my favorite part of the Oscars every single year is the in memoriam part where they show the people who have passed. And uh, a friend of mine said, it's a sign that we're getting older, that you start to recognize more and more and more of the names. Whereas if you saw the Oscars when you were a kid, it's like, okay, I've never heard of them. I never heard of them. They did what? Okay. That's just part of adulthood too. Acknowledging that we are mortal and that yeah. everybody's going to die. And that even people who are beautiful or talented or wealthy or powerful or athletic they're all going to go. Eventually, you'll get to the point where you're reading the obituaries just to see if you knew anybody that was in there. All right, so that's our show for today. I hope you uh, enjoyed it, if that's possible. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Your father had a podcast and did 34 episodes. I dare you to do better. Okay. Good night. Thanks for listening. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. I know plenty of goth girls who would die for the chance to be sucked by a vampire. Charlie's gaze shot to her neck. I hope you're not one of them. No, Charlie, I want to suck, not to be sucked. Huh. Well, Check, down. please. <laughs>